Yeah, happy to happy to be back, so to say, in a real life meetup. Uh, cool, fantastic feeling. I'm talking today about the power of reactive architectures and actually how we can leverage it. Whoever worked in a reactive architecture, whoever worked with reactive systems, one guy, okay, who knows about reactive programming, who does Angular, reactive, RxJS, and stuff like this, okay. Okay, good. I think I prepared a good talk um, because I start from the basics and then we go down to the rabbit hole. Um, so stick with me. I'm not sure how long it will take, um, but, but it, should, it, should, it should be something for everyone. Um, so first things first, my name is David Leitner. I'm a coding architect here at Square Solutions. Um, so if you have anything what you want to know, what you don't understand, what you see differently, um, feel free, of course, to interrupt me. Um, feel free to talk to me afterwards or also feel free to contact me afterwards. And let's jump right into the topic. Um, what is reactive? Yeah, that's, I think, one of the obvious questions in this talk. And we see reactive everywhere these days, right? We see React, we see Redux, we see Project Reactor, um, we see IXJS here, and lots of other initiatives kind of handle the idea of reactive programming. And reactive programming is basically the idea of programming and designing upon asynchronous data streams. So I guess most of you know what a stream is. <laughs> um, but usually when I describe streams, describe streams, um, it's, it's not always clear to the people. Um, so, so I will do my best um, to, to give you an understanding because a stream is basically a, a very simple concept in programming. Um, so if you think about programming data structures, we basically have two axes. We have the space and the time axis. This sounds spacey now, but obviously it's very simple. Um, in singular space, and in synchronous time, we have something which we tend to call a value, right? With a get and a setter. Shouldn't be surprising. In plural space and in singular time, we have something which we tend to call a collection with an iterator and a generator. And if we now move from synchronous time to asynchronous time, but stay in singular space, anybody knows what we have there? Future promises, Future promises exactly. So we have in many languages, we call it promises. In other things, we call it feature or completable feature. And if we stay in asynchronous time, but move into plural space, then we have the streams, right? So basically, that's a stream. And the thing about streams, in comparison to all the other data structures, is that they are usually not natively supported in, in most programming languages. So there are less programming languages out there which support streams out of the box, which treat them as first-class citizens. So that's why we use tools, for example, like reactive extensions. So we have reactive extensions for nearly all programming languages. So you can see them here. Um, and basically what they do is they provide this data container in form of streams, sometimes also in form of completable features um, into our runtime, into our programming language, right? So what is it now, reactive programming? Um, usually in the reactive community, we bring this example of a variable counter with a value one and a variable doubled, which is counter multiplied by two, right? So doubled is, what's the value of doubled here? Two, two exactly. And if we change counter to three, <laughs> what's the value of doubled? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if we change, what, what's the value of double after the third line? Still. Exactly, still two. And what we need to do to increase or to update double this, we need to actually um, rerun this assignment again and say double is counter multiplied by two. And this relationship between them is implicit. So the relationship between doubled and counter is actually implicit in, in imperative programming. And that's basically the concept or the criticism reactive programming has on iterative programming, right? And people then invented something which we usually tend to call the destiny operator, different names for it. And you see it here. I'm not sure if everybody sees it, but I changed the sign here. Yeah? And with the destiny operator, for example, if we change counter now to three, right? And if we were in a unit test and make an assertion, then counter and then doubled would be six, right? And that's basically the main concept of reactive programming. And what has this all to do with streams? Well, Usually this is implemented by streams. So counter is a stream, right? With a value one, as we've seen. Doubled 
is a stream transformation. So we map the existing stream multiplied by two. And basically, we have a lot of stream transformations, for example, by RX extensions or by, by Project Vector, which we can utilize on streams. And when we then, for example, change counter to do, all we do is we move, or change counter to three, sorry, all we do is we move the three into the counter stream, and this automatically updates, of course, the double stream, right? And that's basically reactive programming. That's basically the idea because now we have doubled equals to six. And that's a theoretical concept, but in real world examples, if we, for example, use RxJS, I guess some of you know it because it's, it's um, very popular in the Angular framework or in the Angular community. And that's basically the same code which I just showed you in RxJS, right? We have a behavior subject, it's basically a stream with an initial value of one. Then we pipe the counter, map it, multiply it by two. And then if we change the counter to three, doubled will be automatically six, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the heart of reactive programming. That's it. It's not more complicated, right? And modern frameworks like, for example, Svelte, they do it, they do it even more beautiful. Yeah? They even integrated the destiny operator in their language, so to say. For example, in Svelte, if you put a dollar sign in front of doubled, it will be reactive value. So it will always update if you change, I'm sorry, if you change counter, <laughs> um, it will update the double, right? Okay, so come on, show me a down-to-earth example. That, that was basically the, the idea of reactive programming. What, what has this to do with our daily doing? Um, we see a lot of applications moving into this paradigm, right? For example, if we think of a simpler, yet another mail service, right? Um, a few years ago, I guess we would have implemented in a way that if we need new emails, we have a reload button here, right? And this reload button usually triggers a controller. This controller usually goes to or stores all the emails and then goes to a REST um, service and asks, hey, give me the new emails, right? So we get a new email, we store it in controller, and what we do then is we update all our UI elements, say, hey, there's now a new email, so two new emails. Um, we update um, the list of emails and we update the count of emails, right? And this kind of sucks if you if you ever were in a situation because usually you always forget to update one of these values, right? Um, and a simple solution for this would be reactive design, would be reactive programming. So if we, for example, just introduce a stream here, um, then we basically don't need a reload button anymore because we have a stream and the stream contains emails. And what we then do is we just do simple stream transformations. So we say, we subscribe here to the stream, and basically what we do is a count. So we have the amount of emails. What we do here is we subscribe to the stream and we make a collect. And what we do here is, and the collect in the map, and what we do here is we subscribe to the stream and basically make a filter if emails are new and then make a count on it, right? And then in comparison to before, classical REST clients, we would basically have something which is going more into a push direction, right? So for example, a WebSocket client, which pushes us new emails. So when a new email arrives, basically all it does, it pushes it to the stream. And then, yeah, everything is happening on its own because when the stream changes, everything else is kind of subscribed and will automatically change, right? And that's, that's the power of reactive programming, right? So, we move from a pull-based design to asynchronous push-based design, okay? So this talk was not about reactive programming, but I think it is an important aspect to understand reactive architectures. Because basically what we do is we take the concept of reactive programming, as we very often do in software engineering, we take the concepts of software design and move them up to software architectures. So we basically take the same concepts, which we use in reactive programming, and move them to reactive architectures. That's, that's what we basically do. So how does this work and why do we actually even need this? So back in 2010, um, when I would say started um, my, my first big project, um, architecture usually looked like this. So we have this BBC architecture. Who knows BBC architecture? The box, box, cylinder architecture, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is... <laughs> how it usually looked like. And what, what since 2010 changed is, is fundamental, right? I'm not sure if everybody realized this, but in 2010, the internet had 1.4 billion users, okay? In 2020, the internet has 4.7 billion users, 
Facebook has 2.8 billion users and YouTube has 2.1 billion users. So in 2020, a single website may have double, twice much as traffic as, as the whole internet 10 years ago, right? And of course, this triggered a change in how we design our systems. And this triggered a few clever guys who invented the Reactive Manifesto. Who knows the Reactive Manifesto? Okay, quite a few. So if you Google the Reactive Manifesto, you get to this page. It looks exactly like this, right? And if you scroll down, you get to this page or part of the page, and then you see this image. And everybody is then confused when he sees this image. But actually, you, you can skip all this stuff. You don't need to read it. You just need to understand this image, OK? Who understands this image? Somebody who understands this diagram with all the arrows and all the words on it? Do we have to explain it? <laughs> <laughs> I will explain it to you so that you under, that, that everybody understands it because basically it's it's not it's not that hard as it looks like. So all starts with non-functional requirements, right? So we usually design software architecture based on non-functional requirements. We want to have software scalable, we want to have it elastic, I don't know, we want to have it testable, we want to have it maintainable, we want to have it independent deployable, all these non-functional requirements which actually define which architecture we choose. And when we talk about reactive systems or reactive architectures, then the non-functional requirement we are striving for is responsiveness. So this means that whenever you talk to a system, you get a response, you get a reaction of the system. So the system should always be available, should be highly resilient. And the interesting idea about the reactive manifesto or the picture of the reactive manifesto is that they say, if you want to have a, a, a responsive system, you need to have two values. You need to be elastic and you need to be resilient. Okay? So to have a responsive system, you need to be elastic and resilient. And the really important, important part is that they say you can achieve both of them by actually following a message-driven architecture. So if we go message-driven, we support our system to be elastic, we support our system to be resilient, and we support in the in the higher map the system to be responsive okay so i promised you that you understand it i guess you still don't understand it so let's dig deeper into it and let's understand what this really means so let's take a look at elastic so what elastic usually means is that we want our system to be cloud native to be horizontal scalable right so back in the days we scaled our system by putting more memory in it by putting more cpu on it by making just more power on the machine but this is very expensive and usually doesn't work. So what we do is we want to scale out our system. So we want to have multiple instances of our system. So we want to have multiple instances of our microservice being this scenario. And if we go with this, we have here a clash, right? Because microservice A suddenly needs to decide to which instance of microservice B to talk. Of course, we have load balancers, we have reverse proxies, we have all these things. But when we go with a message-driven approach, we can easily solve this problem by putting a stream in between, sending our messages to the stream, and whoever is available just consumes this message when he has time, right? So we can easily support being much more elastic by introducing a message-driven architecture. So that's the, that's the easy part, being elastic, right? The second part being, response, uh, being resilient, sorry. What does this mean? So when microservice A is talking to microservice B, Let's assume we get a request for microservice A. Somebody wants something for microservice A. Microservice A needs to go to microservice B to handle this request. But maybe microservice B has high latency. So maybe it's not really responsive. I don't know. Maybe it has some technical issue. Maybe there is some legacy system involved. And it just takes time to get a response, right? So this actually blocks microservice A because microservice A cannot continue working on incoming requests because it's blocked by waiting for the answer from microservice B. And at some point in time, hopefully, microservice B sends back um, a request, but till then, all the requests pile up here, right? And usually they are blocked. And when microservice B then finally sends back the response, um, we get the response back to the user, and we can continue working on other requests. And this is actually a thing which we usually call back pressure. So in this architectural style here, we do not support back pressure. So we cannot really handle more requests that we can currently um, work on. And message-driven architectures also support us 
in solving this problem, again, by basically putting a queue or a stream in between. And when microservice A now wants to talk to microservice B, all it does, he sends a message to the stream, stores it there, and basically it's done. Sends back to the user, okay, I accepted your request, I will continue working on it, come back if you want to know that it's finished. And once microservice B can consume this message, we can continue sending events into the stream. So microservice A does never block the user. We store them there, we store them there, we store them there. At some point in time, microservice B maybe starts to process one of these messages, takes them out, processes them, sends them back. And basically then we say to the user, hey, um, your event was um, successfully operated, right? And this, of course, brings us a lot of resilience in terms of responsiveness as a higher goal of our architecture. So that's, that's, that's the core points of the reactive manifesto. We support back pressure by decoupling the provider and the consumer, and we support horizontal scaling of our consumers by location transparency. So the provider suddenly doesn't know the consumer anymore, and the consumer can actually um, process events on its own pace. These are the two main advantages we see in reactive architectures. So we move from synchronous pool-based architectures to asynchronous push-based architectures, right? <laughs> so <laughs> let me explain you this in a little bit more, um, I would say, hands-on way. So as I said, when, when we started microservice, I would say nearly a decade, 10 years ago, uh, microservice architectures usually look like this. They didn't look that simple like this, but basically I think you will get the point. Um, we had a web application, this web application was talking to microservice A, microservice A was talking to microservice B, and microservice B was talking to microservice C. And then this all goes back, right? This works, looks good. This is how systems these days often still work. But we have a problem here. As we've seen before, when we send a request to microservice A, this one forwards it to microservice B, and microservice C maybe has high latency, so cannot respond that quickly, we again block the whole system. So the bottleneck of our architecture gets the bottleneck of the whole system, and that's a big issue, of course, right? What did we do? Well, this was the first generation, as I said, of microservices, so integrated um, synchronously without back pressure support. And then this was the high time of queues, right? We introduced queues whenever we wanted to isolate bottlenecks. So we introduced queues here, um, and then basically what we did is we resolved this issue of, of high latency services by introducing this asynchronous integration, right? And what we usually used here is, is things like WebMQ, ActiveMQ, or other MQP implementations, right? So we were partially asynchronous, um, and we had um, at least a little back pressure support, right? And this ended up that we introduced queues everywhere suddenly. <laughs> So um, we started with a few queues here and there for service intercommunication, and at some point in time, we introduced queues everywhere, right? And then people had this idea, okay, if we have no queues everywhere, yeah, if we anyway use them, why don't we put them in the middle of a system, right? And this is basically when event-centric um, systems were born or stream-centric systems were born, where the web application talked to a microservice, usually a backend for fronted or something like this, and this basically just forwards requests to a stream. And then, on the other hand, we have all these microservices again. And what they do basically is they just consume the stream. So, for example, if this is a landing application for online banking, right? So, a new customer. What would happen? The web application would send an event that the new customer should be onboarded. Maybe that's the KVC check. So, this microservice would consume the stream, would say, hey, New customer is on board, that's interesting for me. Sends back, okay, KVC check was successful. The user service actually listens to this event, says, okay, cool, KVC check was successful. I store the customer, I store the user in the database. And at some point in time, maybe an email service or something like this consumes this event from the stream and says, okay, I send an email. That the customer was successfully onboarded, the customer onboarding is done, and we send back um, the, the response to the web application, right? So this is kind of the, the third generation of microservices, I would say. So stream centric and fully asynchronous. And basically, um, this brings a few advantages and it brings also a few new technologies. So usually we use Kafka or Pulsar in, in these architectures um, because, yeah, they support these architectures quite well. 
And there was also a shift in mindset when we went to these architectures because suddenly we realized that basically the events are the system state. And that's, that's a very important and I think also very interesting thought. Because if we think in event-driven architectures, what we usually have is we have a stream of events. Let's assume a stream of transaction, right? So Mark sends Tim 100 euros. Mark sends Maria 70 euros and Tim sends Maria 25 euros, okay? So this is basically the state of our system. But the interesting part is not that we have all these events here. The interesting part is that we actually can always map this um, to, to, to a classical table view, how, how, we, how we know it from existing systems. So if we start again with Max and Tim 100 euros, then we say Max is minus 100 euros as a balance and Tim has plus 100 euros as a balance, right? And then we go to Max and Maria 70 euros, then Max only has minus 170 euros and Maria has 70 euros, right? And then we can go forward to Tim sent Maria 25 euros and then we update the balance again. And the important part is that we have this duality in both directions. So usually people in the, in the event streaming community call this the stream table duality. So we can always map between a stream and a table. And that's a very important concept if you want to understand how active systems work. And a good example for the stream du table durability is usually how we often start to migrate existing systems to such an event-driven architecture, to such an reactive systems. Because in most systems, you don't start from a greenfield, right? I didn't see a greenfield project, I don't know, for, for five years. You always have kind of an, an annoying neighbor you need to integrate to or something like this. So basically, it's never fully greenfield anymore these days. So you always have a legacy database, for example, some, something that starts with O and ends with Echo. <laughs> and usually those databases have something which shows this duality. So they usually have a database log, right? How do you want to handle questions? Should we wait until the end? Mm, how you like it, yeah. I mean, you can no, ask it now. <laughs> is this a good question? <laughs> I only have good questions. Okay, no, then let's ask it, yeah. Our previous slide. Sure. I see how you can get from the event to the table, Yeah. but you have a double error. Can you explain to me how to get that? That's, that's actually on this slide. So, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so usually a database, if you write to a database, if you update a user in a database, then you can derive an event from it, right? And that's what databases internally do. So if you add a new user, then a new user added event is stored in a database log, right? And a user updated event is stored in a database log. And what we then basically do is, what, we, what, what is, which is kind of a, a very important technique these days for migration, is that we go from this database log, connect to it with something which we usually call change data capture, and then store the DB changes in our stream. So for example, we can utilize a an, an legacy Oracle or Postgres database and consume the changes in the database within our stream. And that, that's a fantastic tool to migrate existing applications, right? Uh, a colleague of mine wrote a fantastic article on this, if you want to know more about this, um, how change data captures and other migration strategies work. But just to give you an understanding what I mean, meant with this double error, yeah? with this stream table duality, as it's, as it's kind of important. And what this also basically is, is kind of event sourcing, right? People talk a lot about event sourcing and basically, of course, there's much more in it, but basically it's storing all the events as the system state. And the advantage is that you have to choose the whole truth, nothing but the truth, right? Because you have all the events, you have a reliable audit log, and usually that works great, yeah? So if we now have this event-centric architecture with the stream-centric, integration, right? We have a stream in the middle of our system. Then, of course, people came to the idea and said, okay, if we have this, if we have these events as the system state, why don't we utilize it? And that's what people did, right? We moved the persistence from the microservice into the center. We usually called it an event store, not an event stream anymore. And the interesting thing is then those microservices usually get quite stateless, so they get pure. And we can then utilize, for example, new technologies um, like lambdas, um, Asia functions, 
or Google Cloud Functions, right? And that's basically the idea that we have all the states stored here and that we go into a functional architecture um, with a fully event-centric system. And there are tools to utilize event stores like event store itself, um, which support here, but people also use Kafka or Pulsar for this, which doesn't always have to be a good choice for this, right? But basically it doesn't really matter if we have an event store here or if we just have a stream here. Because in both situations, stream-centric systems are the only way to build autonomous microservices, right? And I know that's a bold statement, yeah? But <laughs> stick with me. <laughs> I tell you it's true, yeah? So there are people who basically say the same thing, who say, I don't know, microservices need to be event-centric. I say basically even that they are the only way to build autonomous microservices. And, and why is it like this? Well, if we if we think about this again, right? This, I don't know, this blueprint microservice architecture a few years ago, where everything was integrated synchronously, right? Then we usually, let, let's stick to a real world example. Let's, let's go with banking. So we have a web banking. We have an account summary service. So this gives us, I don't know, the current balance, the current transactions. So we go to the account summary service. This one goes to the transaction service basically goes to the user service and so on and so forth. And then of course, the account summary service always goes directly to user service and we have, I don't know, a categorization service and a config service, right? So we have a ton of dependencies here during runtime. And of course, if you ever worked for a bank, you know that the transaction service is used by actually everyone, right? Because everybody needs transactions. That's the core value of a bank, so to say. So we have high pressure on this service. And we have low resilience on all the other services because if the transaction service is down, we don't really can do anything, right? And if we then introduce a second customer journey, because that's what we started last year to build microservice based on customer journeys and say, okay, we have now the account summary service, but we also want to have the payment service, the payment journey. Then we can go, of course, from our web banking to the payment service if we want to trigger a new payment. And what we usually then have, of course, <laughs> again, a dependency to the transaction service or a ledger, whatever it is then, right? And I guess we also have a dependency to a user service, right? So when we when we map this, this microservice architecture down to customer journeys, um, then we basically have this payment customer journey, which lives here, right? And we have the account overview customer journey, which lives here. And we see that the overlap is, is quite massive, right? And, and that's not even the, the truth because the overlap is usually much bigger they would both have a dependency to the config server or to the config service. And, and that's, that's really a problem because this comes with a multitude of disadvantages. The first one is that we have low service autonomy. So low resilience, if one of these centric services which is used by many customer journeys and the more customer journeys a domain service use, the higher is the chance that it goes down. That's why these services are, are very unindependent. They have, they have low service autonomy. This leads to weak independent deployability and weak independent scalability. And that's, that's the downside of this so-called entity service anti-pattern, which we saw a few years ago in microservices. So how, how could we fix this? And I, I, I guess whoever worked with microservices has seen such a microservice architecture once. How can we fix this? Well, <laughs> as I promised, um, with reactive systems. And what we usually do is what we always do in reactive systems, there's you know, no problem, you cannot solve with a stream. And um, what, what would change here now is that if a config is changed, right, the config service would send the event to the stream. It would say, hey, I don't know, configuration changed. I put it here, I don't care who needs it, I just put it here. Same for user service, same for transaction service. So if a new transaction is triggered, we put it to a stream. And maybe the categorization service who actually categorizes transactions, subscribes to transactions on the stream, manipulates them, updates a category, or adds a category to a transaction, and sends them back, okay? So that's the domain service part, so to say. And the customer journey part is even cooler, because on the customer journey side, we don't go from payment journey to direct transaction service directly, of course. We would never do this, right? We are responsible engineers. <laughs> we consume transactions. So we subscribe to the stream and say, hey, whenever a new transaction is triggered, give it to me. And we store it and we store it in projections. I will, I will talk more about projections in a second, but basically we just store it as a read model 
whenever we want to do something on a payment journey, we don't need to go to transaction service anymore because we have all the transactions stored here as a projection, right? And we store, I don't know, configuration information or user information, all the information we basically need during runtime at the payment journey service because we co-locate the state and the logic, right? That's one of the principles of object-oriented programming. And if we do microservices right, we need to do the same thing here. And then we have the same thing here. We store a projection of transactions and users and, and whatever, right? And basically, that's, that's, a, that's a very important part. And what people often then get wrong when they use projections is that they start to write in the projections. Now, of course, that's, that's basically not the case, right? You should just read from projections because they are just a read model, right? Usually just want to update the source of truth. So for example, if we want to trigger a new transaction, we go to the stream and say, hey, trigger a new transaction. The transaction service consumes this transaction and stores it in a database. And when the transaction is done, we send back an event. And then basically we update our projection, right? And that's CQS in a nutshell, right? OK? Cool. And we still have one bottleneck. Usually we have HTTP here, or we had HTTP here, which is synchronous, right? So we usually use something which is kind of a web socket, which pushes us information to the front end. And one, one very often used tool these days here um, is, is GraphQL, because it supports subscription out of the box as a first class citizen. OK. So our customer journey autonomy uh, our, our, our scope of these services is much smaller, and this, of course, brings, brings a couple of advantages, right? So we have strong service autonomy, and we have less chattiness between the services at runtime. Um, so we have um, smaller deployment footprints, and we have massively good horizontal scalability, yeah? Because we can scale this service up, I don't know, infinite, right? We just start a new instance, we build up a new projection based on the data which is in the stream. And we can horizontally scale forever, right? That's of course a cool, a cool attribute of an architecture. So I hope you now understood what I meant from going from pool-based architectures to push-based architectures, right? That's that's basically what reactive systems are about. Um, and we at Square we have the we have the advantage or we have the yeah we have the pleasure to work with a, with a couple of very interesting companies and. and, and and partners um, where we can utilize this architecture. And I, I took two examples um, to give you a little bit of understanding why we utilize reactive architectures these days so often and why we think that it's such a such an, yeah, fundamental shift in how we design microservices but distributed systems in general. Yeah? So um, insurance calculations. So basically COVID um, also hit the insurance, I would say industry heavily because usually it was based on, on personal interaction. So usually you went to your insurance um, agent of um, who is basically your friend or you basically know him quite well, but with COVID this, this has changed a little bit. And so this, this, this insurance industry needed to find new channels to the customers, right? And um, what you usually did is you, you went to your insurance agent, you went to his office and said, hey, I don't know, I have a new car. I'm not into cars, so please don't blame me for anything which is wrong here. <laughs> Uh, but basically I said, I, I don't know, I want a new car, right? And then that's what we did. So we kind of designed such a system or built such a system. And what you have done here is you have kind of a GraphQL server. So as I said, GraphQL supports asynchronous communication um, down to the channel. And basically you have an event store and then you have these different microservices. So of course, highly simplified, right? And if you now go to the clerk and say, hey, I don't know, I want to secure or insure my car, then in, in COVID times, you gave him a call, right? And if you have good um, customer experience, he sent you back a link, right? And you opened your link on your iPad, right? And when the insurance agent then changed, for example, something on his form and said, hey, I don't know, you have Alvaro Romeo uh, from 2020, then basically we just send an event over the whole system, right? And we directly send it back to the customer. And there's no F5 or there's no F refresh because we have full push-based architecture in all directions, right? So whenever you change something here, it will automatically be updated here, right? And for example, if the user then clicks on the button that this is correct, 
we do the same thing. We send an event, and basically the event gets pushed back to the insurance agent. And this moves us directly to step two, right? So we don't need to pull for state changes. We always get them pushed into our system. And if the clerk then changes, I don't know, the, the coverage from 200 to 250, right? Then it's automatically updated on the customer side and they usually the, the customer can then sign a digital and they're always, always fine. And basically that's what customers these, times, these days expect, right? They expect real-time integration between all the channels which are using to, to make business results, right? And that's a big advantage of reactive systems because we have real-time integration, so to say, for free. We don't need to implement anything because we get pushed day changes into our system. But a maybe even more interesting use case is, is in banking, of course. As, as I said, we do a lot in the, in the banking industry. And usually banks have, have the need to be high available, right? So if you go to your mobile banking app, you don't want to have it down, right? Usually. Yeah. And it depends a little bit on the balance, I would say, but usually you want to see your balance, yeah? <laughs> and a few years ago, a few colleagues of mine um, did a research for, for a big Austrian bank. And the insights were, were quite interesting. Um, we basically found out um, that the mobile banking usage is heavily focused on transactions and balances, right? So what people usually want to see when they open their mobile bank is they don't want to, I don't know, unlock the card or I don't know, talk to support. They just want to see their current balance and their, their last transactions. So that's 93% of the use cases just showing balances and last transactions. So if you think of yourself, I guess you do the same thing, right? 3% initiate new payment and 4% do any other functionality. So in a, in, a, in a real scrum world, you would not implement all this shit, you would just show balances and transactions, right? <laughs> Uh, but how, how, how do we achieve this? Well, again, if we go with, with, with a reactive system, if we go with a push-based architecture, we have, again, would, would say kind of similar architecture on a high level. And what, what we then do is we introduce here projections. And I mentioned projections already before. They are kind of read models for our channels, okay? So what they basically do is they act as read models for our channels, as I just said, and they subscribe to events and hydrate them into projections. So they subscribe to events that are important for our channel. So basically, I guess it's transactions, right? So whenever a new transaction is triggered, we store them in a projection. But we already store them not in a normalized way. We store them in a denormalized way how we need it on a client, right? So I don't know. We skip a few fields which we don't need, and we kind of transform the data in the transaction, but we store it really as the UI expects it from us, okay? And then, basically, the client only reads from this projection. It only reads from this projection, never goes back to a transaction service and asks for transactions because it knows that it is always the transaction in its projection, right? And then, basically, in a bank, you have multiple channels, right? And, sorry, one thing to mention here, Azura, for example, is a, is a good technology to, to introduce this because it basically is GraphQL with Postgres as projection. But of course, there, there are many other tools um, like Elastic, which is often used as projection, Redis, and, and in, in FluxDB, which is also kind of a, a useful projection. But the interesting part is we often just use in memory as projection, right? So we just store all the transactions in a projection at memory or on memory. And when the service goes down, we just, I don't know, build up the transaction of the last two months, right? And a bank, as I mentioned, usually has multiple channels. So it just not only has a web channel, it usually also has a mobile client, right? And here the projection could look much different. It could be much slimmer because maybe you don't want to show all the transaction details on a mobile client. So you would really just always store the data which you need on a mobile client. And so we have very separated deployment units or very separated um, units of autonomy, right? And the cool part, I think that's the coolest part of the whole presentation now, huh? is if you burn down all this stuff, right, 93% of your customers are still happy because they can read their transactions and they can read their balance, right? And that's basically the power of it, right? And if you go with optimistic UI, you can even, I don't know, bring up this percentage a little bit, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so what is semantics of the projection? And how do you guarantee that it's not like uh, because there are events on the ah, that's yeah. you, you see, only one half problem in computer science left, right? Yeah. You, you don't have cash. Years, but you, you still have a problem here. 
No, you don't have cache invalidation issues anymore because they push you yeah. changes. You but never I mean, ask for changes. I got that, right? Yeah. So those things are being pushed to the stream. There's still latency, pushing those yeah. to the other microservices to the stream. Sure. And they may not have been pushed to the projection of the stream. Right? Sure. That's true. So eventual consistency, I will I will sum it up in the end, yeah. Of course, is one of the downsides of this architecture, yeah. Okay. Very valid point, yeah. So <laughs> let's sum up. So we are finally there. Um, so what have you seen? You have seen lousy memes? Lousy memes within lousy memes? <laughs> I explained to you that the basic concepts of reactive programming, I think that's important to understand. I told you about the reactive manifesto and what it basically means. Very simple. And then I told you this, this bold statement that, that um, stream-centric systems um, are the only way to achieve autonomous microservices. And basically showed you why we should move or why we often move from pull-based architectures to push-based architectures and that we get high resilience and high scalability. But um, this stuff is cool, but as always, architectural styles um, buy you options, right? So this is what James Lewis always says, architectural styles buy you options. And reactive architectures buy you resilience, real-time capabilities, elasticity, and extendability. Um, but as always with architectural styles, you pay with complexity, right? Because the important part here is you buy them. You don't get them for free. And the currency you pay is complexity. And one of the downsides or one of the complexities you, of course, get in reactive systems is eventual consistency, right? You cannot avoid this, but at the one time you have the cup theorem, right? You need to understand, hey, do you want to be highly available or do you want to be highly consistent? And the reactive system is, of course, more on the available side of things in the cup theorem. So basically that's it. But if you consider this, that's my advice, yeah? Maybe start small and shift to reactive systems once you need them. <laughs> Cool. I hope this was useful. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Yeah. 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 Whoever wants first. Anybody else? Okay, then. Um, there was several times mentioned back Say the server says I can't keep up with the with processing your request. Please slow down. With the um, message queues in between, that doesn't happen because client can just create request, put the request in the queue at whatever rate he wants. Yeah, exactly. That, that's basically that, that's the term. We support back pressure by queues, right? So we don't have the problem of back pressure anymore. We avoid it, and and we have a, a back pressure supportive architecture. You know what I mean? But is this really back pressure? Because back pressure is mm -hmm. for the consumer to push back. Say, I cannot handle anymore this. It kind of solves the with problem. Q, you're solving the problem of consistently incoming traffic, mm -hmm. but this is not a back pressure. It's not pushing back. But we don't have the problem of back pressure anymore yeah. because we never so push back, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's why we have full back pressure support. That's why we call it like this usually. Yeah. For example, there are frameworks like Akka that yeah. align the opposite to notify that you cannot take it anymore. Yeah, but also they do basically the same thing, right? They scale up when they cannot take yeah. additional requests anymore. And that's Akka is so so actor driven architectures are kind of similar to what yeah. we do here, right? Actually the manifest was built based on that. Exactly. Yeah. It was was in, in, it was introduced by a couple Akka guys, yeah, or at least some of them. So yeah, it's it's a similar, or it's I would say a related concept, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have some nice button work there on that sheet. Yeah, I know. Where? No, no, not this sheet behind you. And there is this ah. one abbreviation drive. Yeah. How is it, how does it relate to this architecture? Because you mentioned projections where you're duplicating the market. No, I wouldn't say I duplicated, I projected. And that's a that's a very important that's a very important understanding. Duplicating would mean that you lost the data ownership. But we never lose the data ownership of projections. We just project it and the source of truth is always clear. You know what I mean? 
And that's, in, that, that's why I also had this small orange box here that people then start, uh, suddenly start to manipulate on the projection, which makes no sense, right? Or for example, in some cases, you maybe still want to go to the source of truth. I don't know if you do a new transaction and if you, if you don't want to have eventual consistency, but it's clear that the projection is really just a read model. Yeah? It's, not, it's not something which is kind of data duplicated. It's just duplicated for reading. So it's kind of a projection for, for a read use case. Make sense? Yeah. I mean, sure. You, well, don't repeat yourself. You can always <laughs> put this on top of everything. Yeah. But if you want to build independent microservices, you yeah. often have to violate Rust because you don't want to rely on a common library that implements common functionality that then acts as the coupling point. So. Yeah, but the coupling is mainly not the business logic because we are quite good in, in having independent yeah, yeah. domain service. The coupling is usually the data perspective, right? And that's sure. if we push the data to the services and if we co-locate the data with the logic, then we often can solve this problem. Yeah, yeah that's that's, I that's why that. why I had this statement. Yeah. Um, my question was about orchestration versus choreography, and that seems to be exactly the point you're, yeah. you're making, right? Exactly. Where you have the uh, queue-based uh, kind of uh, 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 push, uh, pull-based push paradigm based. Yeah. And versus push, yeah. a string-based, yeah. um, push-based paradigm. That, that is exactly the dichotomy between orchestration and choreography. And yeah, I've been trying to convince no, it's people true. around yeah. for the longest time because we're also in the banking sector, okay. and we're told that in a uh, choreography-based architecture, it is just impossible to discern the workflow. Yeah, because things happen asynchronously, and you don't have a real path of first this happens, then this happens, yeah, then this happens. Yeah, sure. But you have to kind of reconstruct it from, well, from events. Now, it's not impossible. But it's, it's a kind of a shift in thinking, and I, I find that hard to overcome. Yeah, I fully get what you say. I think we also have this experience, um, and I think that's true. The analogy to orchestration choreography is kind of true, and and that's why people like Sam Newman or Martin Follower said, let's go with choreography over orchestration, right? Because basically you get the same advantages, or it's kind of a similar thing, right? And of course, you lose the central, I would say, processing unit where you can define how is your business logic going, but you pay with with bad scalability, right? And you pay with bottlenecks in your architecture. And usually you have to decide which price is higher, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, for example, in, in Kafka, the default retention is seven days, right? So usually that's that's kind of GDPR compliant, right? Yeah. And if you don't want to store data longer than seven days, then, then that's, a, that's a simple solution, right? And in, in Kafka, in, in, in Pulsar, you usually store data in different partitions, right? And you need to decide how do you partition your data. And usually you do this in user IDs, right? So what you then can do is you can fully remove a full partition within the system, right? Or what you also can do is you can send dumps on the events, right? So that you kind of work in a compacted way that you always keep the latest user, for example, so the latest user event, right? Because it's always a, a full document. It's not really an event anymore. It's a document. And then using a dumps on document, which kind of erases the user document. So you don't store the user data anymore. We just have a null value there, for example. Yeah, exactly with dumpstones, right? You could easily send an, 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 an deletion event, for example, and dumpstone event, the data needs to be deleted by the projection, right? So the, the hydration aspect who, who updates the projection, they need to be aware that there are events where we need to delete data, right? Sure, it comes with additional complexity, but I mean, whole, um, whole all Viennese um, companies need to take care of GDPR. So. So we have solutions, yeah. That's why, that's why I'm asking because yeah. there are so many uh, incomplete approaches. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, in distributed systems or distributed data, GDPR is always a thing. Yeah. What we usually do is we really keep um, the, the retention law. So in projections, so keep. So Ah, okay, I get your point now. Okay, so you mean in a really event source system where the, the where you cannot, yeah. For example, in event in event store you can do this, right? You can partition based on users, and then you can remove full partitions, right? Or what we also do is that we kind of um, encrypt the data and remove the key to decrypt it once the user wants to delete his data, right? So there there are multiple options or strategies, yeah. But usually the simplest one are the best, yeah. And the simplest one is to just keep the retention and projections low, right? And in the event store, then you just really also work with a compacted and a stump storm strategy, yeah. Or you go with decryption and, and or full partition removal, yeah. Depends on will and the use case. We can talk afterwards on it, yeah. yeah. Would, would be interested, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I would add to that just extreme storm um, synchronous storm. Um, we can't avoid it. All of a sudden, we will deploy sensitive. And if we have a compact topic, for example, Kafka, which has a community event, yeah. we can actually send it to everyone. And if you have a full base mechanism, you can't guarantee in microservice that everyone makes sure to delete all the data related to this customer. So I would bring a counter argument that actually JDPR is easier with um, a platform like Kafka or event store because you can directly tell him please forget about this information just by using the same key and the compact discussion. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I, I would put that on top of you, sorry. So it depends <coughs> what you need to prove, no? For liability. Like do you need to prove that nothing is there anymore or do you need to prove that you cannot use it anymore? Right? So like uh, both things are valid. So true, as long so as you don't true. have the personalized information here. Doesn't matter. True, but what I what, what meant to say is that the complexity in both cases probably is obvious more by just having to monitor it and prove it somehow that you're not able to use something anymore. It, it depends. For example, if you use um, for backend or front end something like, I don't know, Kafka Spirit or Spark, where you have an automated way to materialize the user based on topic, yeah. I would say that the complexity decreases. Uh, I would always say yeah. Because it's basically. You don't change anything in the implementation you get it. That's true. And if you talk about it now, I remember the first GDPR implementation did I did or I was involved in was actually by utilizing RapidMQ to send everybody that he needs to delete data now, right? And this goes directly in the direction what you're saying. Yeah. Because in pool based architectures it's even harder to know who is storing my data and even telling him, hey, remove it, right? Because they ask for your data. They never ask you to tell him what to do with you. Is your data? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, scientific computing has been used in message queues for 25 years. So yeah. it's kind of interesting to sort of see the yeah. community up falling together because now everybody's learning. And when you're dealing with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of data points per second, you've often got more than one ring bubble, more than one message. Yeah. 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 Eventual consist consistency is fine. Like Molly is an example. We are actually trying to figure out whether an earthquake is coming. You might have an array of one gigabytes. They've all got three channels, and you've got hundreds of thousands of points. Well, so the only way you can do it is push. What's interesting here is that you talked about this this stream as though it's infinite. Of course, it's not. There are always finite resources on the stream. And if you've got consumers and producers that are producing and consuming at very, very different rates, there's lots of interesting architectural challenges. How many streams do you have? What do you do when you reach the end of the stream when somebody who has an interest in data is asking out there yet? So does that ever come up in these banking e-commerce yeah. applications? Or is it yeah, I totally. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even in the cloud, I mean, you're, you're just, you know, it's, it's, it's horizontal scalability doesn't, doesn't, doesn't fix it. If you're right. Kafka, for example, is a very expensive storage, right, in comparison to S3 buckets. So Kafka is, is not cheap because it usually needs high availability. It usually needs, I don't know, fast 
space or fastest space. So, so basically you're right, streams are usually not infinite, but on the other hand, if you want to have them infinite, I think a system like Kafka really allows you in a banking environment that you never run out of Kafka availability. But what we have in streams is that we have um, two-tier storage, for example, right? So if data gets older, right, we move it to cheaper storage. Or what we basically also do is that we build up based on the stream, we compact it again, or we, we, we have a retention of, I don't know, two years. And after those two years, we store the data somewhere else where it's cheaper, like in a street bucket. Yeah, practically speaking, I wasn't talking about infinite stream, infinite storage. I was talking about the fact that architecturally, if you've got dozens of consumers and dozens of producers, and they're operating in this system where they have different internal clocks, think yeah. of it that way. You've got to architect your stream so that you have more than one stream. You might have five streams. You might have yeah, sure. You have, different collections, you have different thousands of streams, yeah. yeah. Has that kind of architectural problem come up and have you solved that in, in, in the use cases, the customer journeys you talked about? Because this is done all the time. No offense. Yeah, 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 yeah this sure. This is done all the time. We, we also do it all the time. <laughs> in a straight state, you know, to, yeah. to, to deal with scientific data. At, at much, much higher, faster data rates. Than, than but, but what's your concern now? I don't fully get it. Just that one stream. It sounded to me like you, you move at the end of your architectural journey, there's one stream in the center, and that's going to solve ah, okay. the problem. And I don't think that's true. No, no, with one stream, basically, we mean a system like, like Kafka or maybe even a, a multi Kafka cluster. So it's not that we have one topic where we put all our events in, we have, we have I don't know, thousands. Of, of streams in this stream complex, so to say. You've got to architect that partition. You've got to architect what streams make sense. Yeah, They're sure. All the same, right? Yeah, exactly. This is what we then usually tend to call the topics. So this is kind of a stream within the stream. So it's a group where you put in events. Then, yeah? So I'd be interested in a talk on that at some point in the future. Sure, sure. <laughs> you know where we are now. You can always come by for a coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's a good point. If you're interested, I do a lot of workshops on, on these things, and I do one for the HackConf um, in October, and they sent me a promotion code, so I'm happy to share it with you. <laughs> so whoever is interested in this topic, we will dive deeper than in, in, in a six-hour session also in a little bit coding and, and stuff like this, so not just on a, on a conceptual level. Cool, then, uh, yeah, have a nice beer. Yeah. <laughs>